At about at about 6.30 a.m., after a check of the terrain against maps and aerial photographs, Bohm found that the Marines were on Hill 331, not 362 C. It was another 250 yards ahead. The explanation was simple. Given ideal conditions of terrain and weather, and with experienced troops and commanders, a night attack is warfare's most difficult manoeuvre. On Iwo, with its jumble of escarpments nearly the same elevation, it was difficult in broad daylight to distinguish one hill from another, to determine one ridge from the next. In the darkness and rain, the wrong objective had been pointed out and taken. Fortunately, the thrust was in the right direction. At 7.15, after ten minutes of heavy artillery fire against Hill 362C, Marines resumed the attack. But by then, the Japanese were fully awake and resistance was fierce. Not only were the attackers being hit from the front, but from positions bypassed in the silent sweep through the lines. It was late afternoon before 362C was finally in American hands. Berm's outfit was not alone in slipping through scores of slumbering Japanese before being detected. Lieutenant Colonel Robert E. Cushman's 2nd Battalion and Major William T. Glass's 1st gained several hundred yards before heavy fighting erupted around them at 7.30 a.m. One instant everything was quiet. The next, the attack was in an enemy ambush. From directly in front, and from bypassed bunkers and pillboxes only yards away, Marines were caught in a hailstorm of bullets and mortars. Within five minutes, the attack was not only pinned down, but both battalions were cut off from Marine lines. Two of Cushman's companies, Easy and Fox, now were surrounded and in a roaring struggle for survival in an area that would quickly become known as Cushman's Pocket. Tanks and infantry from the 21st Regiment tried repeatedly throughout the day to extricate the embattled Marines, but without success. Fighting as fierce as any during the campaign would rage for six days in the narrow maze of ravines and ridges before the last Japanese gunner and his weapon was silenced. Baker Company's commander, 2nd Lieutenant John H. Limes, had serious doubts that he or any of his men would make it through the first day. The outfit from Glass's battalion had lost 23 dead and 20 wounded by mid-afternoon in holding its position 400 yards in front of the lines, and had lost contact with the rest of the bogged-down attack. Iwo was the first combat for the 22-year-old Chicagoan, but he had become battle-wise since D-Day, and knew something drastic must be done if anyone in the company was to live. If we spend the night here by ourselves, we will all be wiped out, Leems told his platoon sergeant. I am going for help. With that, the lieutenant sprang from behind the cover of a boulder and was spotted immediately by the Japanese, sometimes crawling flat on the ground, other times ducking and darting in a scampering crouch, always under heavy fire from small arms and mortars. He zigzagged toward the rear. I knew that every time I moved it could be the last and that I would probably die out there, he said later. But what else could I do? I was a marine. Fate was with the gallant shavetail on his perilous ten-minute trip across no man's land to the command post. He made it unharmed. Minutes later, after showing Glass on an aerial photograph where the company was being systematically eliminated, Leems headed back to his men. It was twilight, and he was dragging a telephone line along to call in artillery and mortars to cover the withdrawal of the shot-to-pieces outfit. He worked his way across the same terrain, was caught again in a cracking fusillade of enemy fire, and was amazed and grateful to be still alive and unwounded after dashing the last fifty yards like an upright Olympic runner to reach the outpost. Pass the word, Leem said in a voice loud enough to carry over the noise of a falling mortar barrage as he jumped into a foxhole occupied by two startled marines. Be ready to take our wounded and pull back to the lines when I give the signal. Still gasping for breath, he was immediately on the field phone he had brought with him. I will give you map coordinates of where to deliver artillery and mortars so we can get out of here, he told Glass. Shells were screaming through the gathering darkness five minutes later, their roaring explosions driving the Japanese to cover as the Marines began their desperate trip to the safety of the lines. Some carried wounded comrades on their backs, and it was nearly 10pm before the pullback was completed without further casualties. But Baker Company was on the brink of extinction, bled white and all but wiped out in nineteen agonising hours since the pre-dawn attack began. 
fewer than two dozen men came back unhurt. To make matters worse, Limes found that several wounded had been left behind in no man's land, missed in the black night during the confusion of the pullout. With no thought except to do what he knew must be done, Limes crawled alone through the darkness and dragged one marine back. Then he went out again and brought in another. They were my men, my comrades, he said the next day, and they would have been out there, come hell or high water, bringing me in if the situation was reversed. Baker Company's commander would be wounded before Ewo was captured and would receive two medals for his part in the island's conquest, the Purple Heart and the Medal of Honour. Cushman's Pocket was a dusk-to-dawn nightmarish battle for survival for Easy and Fox companies, surrounded by fiercely resisting Japanese entrenched in a complex of caves, pillboxes, trenches and dug-in tanks. First, Lieutenant Wilsey A. O'Bannon was fearful that his Company F would cease to exist by daybreak. Captain Maynard Schmidt was no more optimistic about the prospects for his men in Company E. Both units had been isolated and unable to move in any direction since mid-morning, O'Bannon with 41 troops and Maynard with 44. Tanks tried twice to extricate them, both times without success. The first attempt failed when the lead Sherman triggered a roaring chain of explosions when it hit a landmine, lost its treads, and blocked the narrow ravine that was the hoped-for escape route. Boulder-strewn terrain and intense fire from anti-tank guns stopped the second rescue mission. Without hope of immediate help, Easy and Fox companies did the only thing possible. They dug in and fought for their lives. We were in one big mess and we knew it, O'Bannon recalled when he and 19 survivors finally made it to safety after 36 hours in the death trap. Schmidt got back to the lines with nine men. Japanese positions were so near on all sides that the enemy taunted the Marines when they were not being cut down. We could not see anything from our foxholes. O'Bannon remembered, and sticking your head up meant losing it. From the Japanese came intermittent shouts, Hey, stupid Marine, tonight you die. Charge! O'Bannon was glad there had been no attack. It would have been curtains for us, he said. Except for Cushman's pocket, where the Japanese were in firm control, March 7th had been a gratifying day for the 3rd Division. General Erskine's gamble on the pre-dawn attack had paid off despite heavy losses to the 9th Regiment, the near debacle of taking the wrong hill in the darkness and having to swarm 362 C in broad daylight. Although nearly all the basic dope was bad, Colonel Berm noted in his battle journal, the strategy proved very sound since it turned out that the open ground taken under cover of darkness was the most heavily fortified of all terrain captured. Marines had paid a high price for Hill 362C, nearly 600 men dead or wounded. But now nothing could drive them from its crest, and its capture had removed the last major obstacle blocking the final breakthrough to Iwo's northern shoreline in the centre of the island. From now on, it is all downhill, Erskine said, and the end, thank God, is in sight. If anyone on Iwo was the epitome of a professional fighting man, it was one of the general's men, Sergeant Reed Carlos Chamberlain. He had joined the corps in the late 1930s and was a swashbuckling 22-year-old corporal serving in the Philippines when Pearl Harbor was attacked. For five months his outfit fought side by side with outnumbered and outgunned American soldiers and sailors and a small and ill-trained Filipino army before being smothered by a million-man Japanese invasion force. Chamberlain was on Corregidor, wounded and plagued with malaria. When the island fortress in Manila Bay fell to General Masaharu Homa's troops on May 7, 1942. In the wild confusion of the final shots and surrender, he managed to evade the conquering Japanese, found a leaky boat, and escaped with three men to Mindano Island, where they somehow located a band of American and Filipino guerrillas who nursed him back to health. During the next 15 months, Chamberlain fought in and then led countless hit and run raids against the Japanese. Word of the corporal's leadership and daring reached General MacArthur in Australia, who commissioned him a second lieutenant in the United States Army. American submarines by mid-1943 were making regular runs to supply the guerrillas with ammunition and medicine, and to collect first-hand intelligence. MacArthur ordered one of the missions to bring Chamberlain back to Allied Southwest Pacific headquarters at Melbourne, where he was promoted to first lieutenant, 
awarded the Army's Distinguished Service Cross for extraordinary heroism and sent by air back to the States for a hero's welcome and to sell war bonds. Like Manila John Basilone, this was not Reed Chamberlain's version of what a professional fighting man should be doing in wartime. He resigned the commission, rejoined the Marine Corps, traded his officers' bars, and all that went with them for the stripes of a leatherneck sergeant, and asked for combat duty. An obliging but confused personnel officer sent him to the 3rd Division in time for the Iwo campaign. Now, in the late afternoon of D plus 16, Sergeant Chamberlain and several men were making their way to the front from the 9th Regiment's command post. As a battalion runner, he had made the trip several times during the day, each time using his combat skills to evade snipers who had been especially troublesome. Alvin Josephy, the Marine correspondent, was among the group. He and the others believed that the area had been cleared of Japanese, although mortars still fell with uncomfortable frequency. We were picking our way among the stones, he wrote, when three shots rang out from the hillside. Startled, Marines scrambled for cover behind boulders. Chamberlain snapped his Colt pistol from its holster, looking for the source of the enemy fire. There was another shot, Josephy recalled. We heard a thud. We thought the bullet had struck the curving side of the ridge. Suddenly there was bedlam as Marines sprayed the area, still unable to spot the sniper's nest. Again, Josephy. A jeep ambulance driver and an automatic rifleman crouched behind nearby rocks, their teeth clenched, their hands gripping their weapons. We called Chamberlain but received no answer. Other men joined the fray, emptying their clips in a fury of futility. One burly sergeant stood straight up without a helmet on, Joseph, he said, and fired his carbine from the hip, moving directly at a hole as he fired. The ambulance driver found Chamberlain slumped against a rock. His eyes were open, but he was dead. The thud the Marines had heard was the bullet that took his life. It remained for Josephy to write Chamberlain's epitaph. With minor variations, the same words could have been used for thousands of others who died on Iwo. There is nothing you can say or do when a good friend is suddenly martyred in battle. You feel stunned, angry, sad and frustrated. We could have fired point-blank the rest of the day at those holes. The Japanese would only have laughed at us. In an instant they had claimed one of our best men. Chamberlain's wonderful war record had ended abruptly. After so many heroic deeds, it seemed an added tragedy that he lost his life while doing nothing but walking. There was nothing anybody could do about it. Business as usual was the pattern of D plus 16 along the 5th Division's front. Colonel Graham's 26th Regiment moved out at daybreak without artillery support, not as a tactic to surprise the enemy, but because marine howitzers were short of shells from the previous day's heavy shelling. But the Japanese were caught off guard by the absence of pre-jump-off shelling, and the advance quickly made nearly 200 yards, overrunning a defensive complex on a hill that had held up the previous day's advance. Some marines rested while others proceeded to surround the knoll, north of the rubble of Nishi village. For the most part, things were quiet. Only the occasional hiss of a flamethrower's jet stream of fire and the explosion of a satchel charge, as demolitions men sealed bypassed cave entrances. In fact, things were too quiet to suit suspicious old timers. One man atop the ridge thought he detected the muffled sounds of hand grenades exploding beneath him. Suddenly there was a gigantic blast that could be heard on Motoyama No. 1 and on the summit of Suribachi. A flash of flame shot into the air, followed by a series of rumbles and a chain of more explosions. The hill shuddered for an instant before its top blew sky high. Dozens of men were swallowed in the mammoth crater. Others were blown into the air like ragdolls, stunned by concussion and wounded by cascading rocks and chunks of concrete. Marines on the slopes scrambled to the top and frantically began digging out comrades. One Marine struggling down the slope saw Japanese trying to escape from caves, only to be buried in landslides that sealed up most of the holes in the ridge's sides. What the enemy had done would happen repeatedly during the final phase of the battle. They had blown up their own command post, putting to death and wounding scores of Marines at the same time, in this instance claiming nearly half a hundred 26th Regiment casualties. Colonel Liversedge's 28th Marines had easier going in their push along the western shoreline. They jumped off at 9.05am against light resistance that caused them less difficulty than the terrain. 
With gunfire from destroyers paving the way, the attack had little trouble moving 500 yards toward Kitano Point. There were several anxious minutes just before sundown, a poison gas alarm that lasted less than a quarter hour before it was discovered, the alert was caused by a strong breeze blowing sulphur fumes and the smell of a smouldering enemy ammunition dump that had been hit by marine artillery. But the advance was not without cost. Sniper fire, hand grenades and mortars took their toll. All things considered, however, it was one of the best days the 28th had experienced since the flag raising on Suribachi. Japanese infiltrators were active along the 4th Division front in the post-midnight hours of D plus 16, making repeated small-scale attempts to find a weak spot in the lines. Captain Headley's battalion was the target of the first raid, but the intruders were spotted and wiped out before they reached marine positions. Major Mee's battalion was hit by the next foray, a probing action that began in silence and then erupted into a two-hour firefight before it was over and the enemy destroyed. Point-blank rifle and grenade duels flared along the 200-yard front, a frantic battleground lighted by star shells falling among the ridges and gullies. Some of the 50-man Japanese force were able to sneak around outposts and jump into marine foxholes before being discovered, only to die in man-to-man -man combat fought with bayonets, pistols, knives, entrenching tools, even rifle butts and rocks. A dozen Japanese hugging the sides of one ravine were spotted in the glare of a parachute flare and instantly dead by rifle and machine gun fire. When dawn came, Mee's men counted 50 lifeless Japanese in and around the marine positions, but 13 marines also had been dead in the furious melee. It was too much to pay, even if we would have terminated a company of the Japanese, a bitter platoon sergeant said. Dry canteens were found on many of the riddled enemy, a sign that the Japanese were not only bent on taking the lives of marines, but also trying to find water. Others carried no ammunition to reload empty rifles. The only weapons of two infiltrators were anti-personnel mines strapped around their waists, self-destructive devices they had been unable to use. Elsewhere along the line were minor scrimmages, frequent and heated exchanges of close-in rifle and grenade fire that kept weary marines awake and alert. Then, at 5.02 a.m., a large Japanese rocket made a direct hit on the command post of the 23rd Regiment's 2nd Battalion. It was one of the few instances during the battle that one of these missiles found its target, this time with devastating results. Died in the blast was the outfit's communications chief. Every other man in the command post was wounded. Major Robert H. Davidson, the outfit's commanding officer, his executive officer, Major John J. Padley, Captain Edward J. Schofield, the operations officer, the battalion adjutant, and two sergeant clerks. Lieutenant Colonel Edward J. Dillon, the regimental executive officer, took over from Davidson, stunned by concussion but otherwise unhurt. He was back on the front four days later and would lead the battalion for the rest of the campaign. But the battle was over for the others, evacuated to hospitals in the Marianas. When the 4th Division attack began at 7.30 a.m., it found the Japanese somewhat subdued. The usual enemy rifle and machine gun fire, the hand grenades and mortars, the sniper bullets pinging into advancing troops. The Japanese firepower around Turkey Knob had been, as the day's action report would say, notably reduced. Gains for the day were unimpressive along the front, but casualties were relatively light as the Marines fought to drive to Iwo's eastern shoreline. It was now only a matter of time until the savage sector no longer was an obstacle to the capture of the island. Only a matter of time and more casualties until marines no longer would be wounded or die in overwhelming strong points among the cliffs above the East Boat Basin. The monks of Makalapa had expected would be taken on D-Day. Now that the 3rd Division had all but broken through to the coast in the centre, and with the 5th Division closing in on Kitano Point on the west, General Schmidt was ready to light the fuse for the final phase of the campaign. He did not expect the job to be finished that day or even during the week. Cushman's pocket remained a fatal ground for the 3rd Division. The 4th Division still had its hands full with die-hard Japanese around Turkey Knob, and the 5th faced an unknown number of deeply entrenched troops holding out with General Kuribayashi among the violence-infested rocks and gorges in its sector. But, like General Erskine, the 5th Corps commander was certain that the end, thank God, is in sight. 
John Antonelli's battalion from the 27th Marines moved out at 7.30am to begin the push on the 5th Division front. Easy Company, led by 29-year-old First Lieutenant Jack Lummis, was the spearhead and immediately came under scathing small arms and mortar fire. Despite the storm of resistance in the heavily mined area of caves and concrete emplacements, Lummis's men ground out an advance of some 200 yards during the morning. Then the attack bogged down, halted by a complex of bunkers and pillboxes. Oblivious to a torrent of machine-gun bullets, grenades and mortars, Lummis stood upright and was sprinting forward to rally the troops when a grenade blast knocked him to the ground. Stunned by the concussion but otherwise miraculously uninjured, the lanky officer from any Texas got to his feet and charged the position from whence came the grenade. He eliminated its occupants with a single sweep of his submachine gun, but fragments from another grenade ripped into his shoulder before there was time to take cover. Hardly faltering despite his wounds, Lummis swarmed another emplacement and wiped out its three occupants. Only then did he motion for the company to follow. With himself twenty yards in front, shouting marines were surging forward when the lieutenant vanished from sight in the thunderclap of an explosion that sent rocks and dirt skyward. The men could see Lummis when the debris settled. We thought he was standing in a hole, one of them said. A landmine had given him serious wounds. On gory stumps, the lieutenant waved and shouted, Keep coming! Keep coming! Do not stop now! Several ragged, dirty, tired, cursing riflemen, some with tears now flowing down grimy faces, ran to his side to see if they could do anything. A comrade, since the long-ago days when the division trained at Camp Pendleton, wondered aloud whether or not to shoot him to end his agony. A not surprising reaction that immediately passed, since Lummis continued shouting, God damn it, keep moving, you cannot stop now! Tears turned to raging fury as Easy Company swept ahead an incredible three hundred yards, overwhelming foxholes and pillboxes and bunkers, bolting across ravines and scrambling up ridges, blasting cave entrances and sniper pits. The spark that ignited the steamroller charge was the horrifying sight of their mortally wounded, indomitable commander and his fathomless courage. Seeing him, the men knew what they had to do. Surgeons at the 5th Division Hospital were powerless to stop the massive bleeding draining Loomis's life away. All they could do was relieve his pain with morphine and give him blood transfusions, 18 pints in all. But a determination to live and his stamina, he had played football and was an All-American end at Baylor University, kept him alive for several hours, always conscious and sometimes smiling and talking to the doctors. I guess the New York Giants have lost the services of a damn good end, he said at one point to Lieutenant E. Graham Evans, one of the surgeons. Lieutenant Howard Stackpole, another doctor and a fellow Texan friend, stopped by in the late afternoon. Both knew the end was near. He was smiling as he closed his eyes and died, Stackpole remembered. Lummis's Medal of Honor was the twentieth earned in the eighteen days since the invasion began. That night, what remained of Easy Company was atop the last ridge overlooking the ocean at Kitano Point. Jack Lummis's men had advanced another two hundred yards as he was dying. To them, he was still their leader, and always would be. Private First Class James D. LaBelle also lost his life that day in the 5th Division push, and he too would be awarded a posthumous Medal of Honor. The action of the 19-year-old from Columbia Heights, Minnesota, did not inspire a spectacular charge by his comrades, but it saved the lives of two of them. Like so many young riflemen in the 27th Regiment's 2nd Battalion, LaBelle was fighting his first battle and his last. Several times since D-Day, death had missed him by inches. In the push across the island at the base of Suribachi, machine gun fire died three men next to him. Three days later, a mortar landed on the edge of a shell hole where he had been pinned down with four men. LaBelle was the only one who was unwounded. On D plus ten, a sniper's bullet took the life of his best friend as they advanced side by side toward Nishi Ridge. Now LaBelle's platoon was caught in the same firestorm of machine guns, grenades and mortars ripping into Lummis's men. He and two others took cover behind a boulder near the mouth of a burned-out cave, waiting for things to get better. LaBelle saw the silhouette of a Japanese in the mouth of the cave and watched as he lobbed a grenade. It landed too far away for the Marine to throw it back. 
Shouting a warning, he leaped to cover the explosion with his body and died instantly in the blast. LaBelle's luck had run out. This time it was his comrades who survived. Third Division troops, meanwhile, whittled away at Cushman's pocket and continued the drive to reach the northern shoreline. Artillery blasted enemy lines for ten minutes before the attack began at 7.50 a.m. Then tanks rumbled forward, firing into caves and pillboxes blocking the advance to the sea. At day's end, the push had carried to within 300 yards of splitting Ewo across the highlands in the centre. The 4th Division kept up its pressure to wipe out the last resistance around Turkey Knob. It was doubtful this could be done during the day, but there were encouraging signs that remaining enemy strongpoints were crumbling and would be silenced by the next day's attack. General Cates was concerned about it all, wondering if he still had enough men and firepower to finish the job. On D plus 18, Cushman's pocket showed few signs of losing its fury. In Ewo's familiar pattern, Marine artillery and Navy gunfire drove the enemy underground before the attack jumped off. When the attack began, it came under the usual torrent of Japanese fire, small arms and mortars from hidden strongpoints untouched by the heavy shelling. Minor gains were made in the morning by tank-supported infantry, but the spearhead Sherman was knocked out by satchel charges and the push ground to a halt. By mid-afternoon it was obvious that the stubborn corridor would hold out longer and claim more marines before it was finally overrun. While the main thrust pounded the obstreperous pocket, a patrol from the 21st Regiment's 1st Battalion had skirted around the front and driven to the cliffs overlooking Ewo's north shore. Lieutenant Paul M. Connolly and his 27 men were amazed at how easily the final breakthrough had been made. They had met only sporadic resistance, and it had been quickly overcome without casualties. All of us just stood there for several minutes, Connolly recalled years later, staring at the waves lapping over the beach. The jubilant men scampered down the rocky bluff, moving rapidly past cave entrances and bunkers demolished by naval gunfire and airstrikes. It was eerie, the lieutenant said, not a sound except the gentle surf. Several men walked nonchalantly into the water and scooped it up in handfuls to splash their faces. Others gingerly shed shoes and socks they had worn for two weeks and waded in the cool sea. It was like a beach party in California, one of the men said, but it did not last long. While most of the patrol frolicked in the surf or rested on the inviting beach, Connolly was on the radio with regimental headquarters. He knew the surge to the sea was more significant to the conquest of Iwo Jima than the flag raising on Suribachi, although not as spectacular or had the scene been captured in a photograph for history to remember. But the 3rd Division had reached the island's northern shore and had at last split General Kuribayashi's rapidly dwindling force into two pockets. Bring back a canteen of seawater, an exultant Colonel Withers told the lieutenant. I would like to taste it and send the rest along to General Erskine, he said. The beach party reverie lasted less than ten minutes, long enough for Connolly to fill the canteen and start it on the way to the 21st Marines command post. Bypassed Japanese watched the spectacle and used the time to set up mortars and target them on the Marines. Shells were falling moments later among the unwary leathernecks, wounding seven. They were carried to the crest of the cliff where the patrol dug in for the night. Connolly's outfit, Able Company of the 21st Regiment's 1st Battalion, had landed with nearly 400 men. Only three of the original complement made it to Ewo's northern shore. The others of Company A were replacements. That evening, as another brilliant sundown came to the island, a runner appeared at Erskine's command post with Connolly's canteen. It was wrapped with white tape from a battle dressing that read, forwarded for inspection, not consumption. The Big E was gratified but misty-eyed when he saw the memento, pleased by the historic breakthrough, sorrowful over the cost. In its drive to the coast, the 3rd Division had lost more than half its original attack troops, 3,563 men dead, wounded or missing in action. Thursday night was hectic on the 4th Division front. It was the eighth day of the march, exactly 39 months since the Pearl Harbor attack, and General Kuribayashi's troops were determined to make it a memorable anniversary. Nearly a thousand Japanese, probably the largest single force still available to the enemy commander, began infiltrating marine lines at 11pm, 
hitting the boundary separating the 23rd and 24th regiments. It was a motley gathering, mainly survivors of naval units, well organised but poorly armed. Many intruders had only bamboo spears. A few had small supplies of hand grenades and rifles. Some carried landmines strapped to their bodies, self-destructive squads with a common thought, to eliminate marines as they blew themselves to smithereens. The heaviest weapons of the attackers were a few light Nambu machine guns. Easy Company of the 23rd Marines 2nd Battalion was first to spot the enemy movement, shadowy figures crawling slowly and quietly down a ravine, some of them carrying stretchers and shouting, Corman! Corman! In passable English, were within ten yards of Lieutenant Colonel Dillon's command post before the alarm was sounded. From then on, close-quarter fighting raged until dawn. Shouts of Totsukegi could be heard over the clatter of marine machine guns and rifles. Grenades and mortars exploded among the Japanese, cutting them down in sickening numbers but not stopping the screaming attack. Parachute flares and star shells illuminated the roaring of man-on-man -man combat. A captured Japanese, a Navy pilot, later said his orders were to break through to Motoyama No. 1, steal a B-29 and fly to Tokyo. He did not know how this would keep the Marines from taking Iwo Jima, but he was willing to try anything to get off the island alive and still save face. One by one or in small groups, the attackers were wiped out. At daybreak, fewer than 200 Japanese were able to crawl back to their lines. Marines tallied 784 enemy dead, although not without heavy losses to themselves, 90 men dead and 257 wounded. But the heaviest attack the Japanese would mount during the battle had been beaten back. A measure of the ferocity of the night-long melee was reflected in the amount of ammunition used by Company E, 500 hand grenades, 200 rounds of 60mm mortars, 200 star shells, and nearly 20,000 rounds of .30 caliber machine gun and rifle bullets. Mopping up operations went on until noon, while other 4th Division units continued the yard-by-yard -yard push toward the eastern shoreline to quell the stiff resistance around the rubble of Turkey Knob. When General Cates's men dug in for the night, they could look down from positions on the ridge and see the ocean at the foot of the cliffs. D-Day plus 18, cloudless and warm. Kelly Turner on the El Dorado was ready to leave for Guam, taking with him most of the remaining ring of warships. The Navy's fighting role in the campaign was almost over, and all the sea power that could be mustered would be needed for the invasion of Okinawa, now just 17 days away. Without ceremony or a personal farewell and well done to General Smith and his Marines, the Admiral left Harry Hill as Nimitz's top commander on the scene. At this stage of the battle there was not much for him, or Howlin' Mad, to do except play cribbage. Only the cruisers Salt Lake City and Tuscaloosa along with several destroyers, remained two miles offshore, on station, and ready for fire missions when ordered. The Enterprise, the last of the big carriers, steamed away with six small flattops and their planes and pilots. From now on, Army P-51 Mustangs would fly air cover for the remaining ships and the Marines at the front. Two thousand troops from General Cheney's Army Garrison Group came ashore from landing ship tanks. When the Marines left, it would be the Army's responsibility to transform Iwo Jima into a mighty American base. That night, 334 B-29s droned northward toward Tokyo in a 60-mile-long formation from the Marianas, flying five miles above Iwo in moon-drenched skies. It had taken the Armada three hours to lift off runways on Guam and Saipan and rendezvous for what would be the most destructive air raid in history, greatly surpassing anything in Europe even the soon-to-come atomic bomb infernos of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Shortly after midnight, superfortresses dropped the first of 1,665 tons of incendiary explosives on the heart of Japan. With Iwo no longer an early warning station for incoming bombers, there was little opposition from fighter planes or anti-aircraft batteries. A sea of flames fanned by a strong wind roared like a typhoon, destroying 16 square miles of the city by daybreak. 84,000 Japanese died in the flames, more than 265,000 tinderbox buildings were destroyed, leaving a million people homeless. The A-bomb dropped on Hiroshima, 142 days later, would cause 24,000 fewer casualties and destroy less of the city. 
the Holocaust exceeded any conflagration in the history of the Western world, including the burning of Rome in 64 AD, the London Fire of 1666, and the burning of Moscow in 1906. Richard Newcomb wrote of the firebombing of Tokyo. Homeward-bound B-29 crews said they could see the glow of flames for nearly 200 miles. Admiral Nimitz and General LeMay met with newsmen the next morning at Commander-in-Chief Pacific Headquarters on Guam. They reported that two damaged superfortresses had landed on Iwo, and 14 others had ditched at sea with their crews rescued by Navy Catalina flying boats based just offshore from Suribachi. We can take these losses, the 20th Air Force commander said, but the Japanese sure cannot. With Iwo in our hands, you can be damned certain this is only the beginning. He paused to light a big Havana cigar and spoke again. It is the absolute beginning of the end for Hirohito and his crowd of warlords. Heavy and costly fighting still faced the marines across the island on D plus 18, especially in the convoluted terrain of the 5th Division sector. So formidable were the natural defences, so deadly and determined was enemy resistance in the zone, that less than 50 yards were gained during the next 48 hours. Major obstacle was a long and low ridge jutting southeast from Kitano Point, a heavily fortified escarpment overlooking a deep draw manned by self-annihilating troops. It would take 15 days to finally wipe out what would become the final pocket of organised Japanese resistance on Iwo. Two battalions from the 27th Regiment, Justin Duria's 1st and John Antonelli's 2nd, moved into the death-dealing maze shortly after daybreak. Both commanders were out of the battle by early afternoon, maimed by a landmine as, together, they were working their way to the front to see if anything could be done to spring the advance. One of Duria's men, platoon sergeant Joseph Julian, was doing everything imaginable to quell the firestorm of small arms and mortar fire from the ridge, and what marines already were calling the Gorge, a place named to rank in ferocity with the 4th Division's meat grinder and Cushman's pocket in the 3rd Division zone. Julian was a 26-year-old career Marine from historic Sturbridge village in Massachusetts. Since D-Day, he had defied the odds in countless rampages that reminded his platoon of the devil-be-damned attitude of his gung-ho friend, PFC Jacqueline Lucas. Now, with the attack less than 15 minutes old, Julian's platoon was pinned down by machine gun fire from several caves. Crawling forward some 50 yards into no man's land, the sergeant demolished one four-man strongpoint with two hand grenades, eliminating its screaming occupants in almost simultaneous explosions. Before Japanese in a nearby cave could swing their machine gun his way, Julian plunged to cover behind a boulder and emptied his carbine in a single burst, wiping out two more enemy troops. At that instant, as the Marine got to his knees, another machine gun nest started firing from a position farther up the ridge's steep sides. While comrades on the line covered him with rifle and automatic weapons fire, Julian got to his feet and dashed back for more ammunition to continue the furious one-man attack. Snatching up a satchel of demolitions, a bandolier of rifle cartridges and a bazooka, he sprinted back into no man's land. You guys stay put until I take care of a few more Japanese, he yelled to the platoon, which watched incredulously as Julian again went to work. Three hours later, the sergeant still had not signalled the troops to move forward, but his intrepid determination had wiped out four more enemy positions, two with demolition charges, one with bazooka fire, and the other with hand grenades. Just when Julian thought the area was cleared enough for the men to advance with a chance of making it alive, a machine gun burst caught him in the chest. He died instantly. His Medal of Honour would be the second in two days for Antonelli's gallant battalion. Like Private First Class James D. LaBelle, Platoon Sergeant Joseph Julian was now a Marine Corps legend of self-sacrifice and devotion to duty. In 14 days since the conquest of Suribachi, the 5th Division had driven five miles up Iwo's western shore and could now look down on Kitano Point, its ultimate objective. But 4,292 more of its men had fallen, 1,093 dead, 2,974 wounded, 220 with combat fatigue, and five missing in action. Except for continued and costly fighting in Cushman's pocket, and bitter but scattered resistance from Japanese holding out in bypassed caves on the cliffs above the northern shoreline, 
the Third Division had completed its mission on Iwo. From now on, most of General Erskine's troops would be engaged in mopping up operations with the 5th Division around Kitano Point. On the 4th Division front, General Cates's weary survivors had put down the last resistance around Turkey Knob, the final jaws of the meat grinder. His troops, too, could now look down on Iwo's northern beaches. Behind them were the two deadliest weeks of fighting in Marine Corps history, 14 days of relentless head-on attack of yard-by-yard -yard carnage, the price of the advance against defiant Japanese dying for their emperor in the man-eliminating defences of Charlie Dog Ridge, Hill 382, the amphitheatre, Minami Village, and Turkey Knob. The two weeks in the meat grinder had cost the 4th Division 4,075 men, 847 dead, 2,836 wounded, 391 with battle fatigue, and one missing. D plus 23 March 14th a day to remember. Dawn to dusk fighting, at times heavy and costly, continued without let-up in isolated sectors where fewer than 2,000 disorganised and shattered remnants of General Kuribayashi's troops held out in the gorge, Cushman's pocket, and in the gullies and ridges east of Turkey Knob. But it was not action on the front that marked the milestone. This was the day when Admiral Nimitz would formally proclaim that Iwo Jima had been conquered, Marines, from privates to generals, later cynically and understandably questioned his timing as tragically premature. They would suffer more than 6,000 additional casualties before leaving the island. Ceremonies began precisely at 9.30am as Nimitz had directed, near the blackened rubble of a huge concrete bunker, incinerated by a flamethrower on D-Day, some 200 yards north of Suribachi. Nimitz was not there. Final conferences with the admirals and generals, who would land and command the marines of the 1st and 6th Divisions in the invasion of Okinawa, had kept him at Commander-in-Chief Pacific Headquarters on Guam. An honour guard of 24 riflemen, eight from each division, stood at parade rest. Dressed in dungarees they had washed the night before, but that showed the wear and tear of more than three weeks of frontline combat, they faced the assembled brass. Generals Smith, Schmidt, Erskine, Cates and Rocky, Admirals Turner and Hill, and the Army's General Cheney. Colonel David A. Stafford, General Schmidt's strong-voiced personnel officer, began reading 113 words that Nimitz personally had written the previous night. I, Chester William Nimitz, Fleet Admiral, United States Navy, Commander-in-Chief of the United States Pacific Fleet and Pacific Ocean Areas, do hereby proclaim as follows. United States forces under my command have occupied this and other of the volcano islands. All powers of government of the Japanese Empire in these islands so occupied are hereby suspended. Four P-51 Mustangs roared across Motoyama No. 1 and peeled off to land, their first close-air support mission of the day completed. A suddenly brisk breeze carried the sound of artillery exploding in Cushman's pocket, three miles to the north. A distracted Stafford paused for several seconds, then continued, All powers of government are vested in me as military governor and will be exercised by subordinate commanders under my direction. All persons will obey promptly all orders given under my authority. Offences against the forces of occupation will be severely punished. Given under my hand at Iwo Jima this 14th day of March 1945. A three-man colour guard, one rifleman from each division, snapped to attention and stepped off a dozen paces to an 80-foot flagstaff embedded in concrete atop the demolished bunker. Twenty-year-old Private First Class, Thomas J. Casal, handed the flag to Private First Class, Anthony C. Yust-19, who unfolded and held it for 24-year-old Private First Class Albert B. Bush to attach to the lanyard. Field musician First Class, John C. Glynn, a 21-year-old bugler, sounded colours. The notes were sharp and clear as Casale quickly raised the flag to the top of the pole, where it snapped in the warm wind. At that instant, the flag on Suribachi was lowered. The admirals and generals saluted. The honour guard responded sharply to the command, Present arms! Knots of nearby men, marines, CBs, air corps pilots and ground crews looked on in silence and saluted, many misty-eyed. Everything was over in less than five minutes. Iwo Jima was officially United States territory. Someone heard Howlin' Mad Smith say to Erskine, This is the worst yet, Bobby. 
The old man wore dungarees, a sun helmet, and an aviator's flight jacket. His eyes were full of tears. Erskine was not quite sure of what he meant. When word of the proclamation and official flag-raising reached President Roosevelt, he was on Capitol Hill to report to Congress on his historic meeting with Winston Churchill and Joseph Stalin at Yalta. After detailing agreements reached by the Big Three to finish the war in Europe, FDR turned to events in the Pacific Theatre. The Japanese warlords know they are not being overlooked, he told the hushed audience of military leaders, cabinet members, Supreme Court justices, lawmakers, foreign dignitaries and newsmen jammed into the stifling chamber of the House of Representatives. They have felt the force of our B-29s and our carrier planes. They have felt the naval might of the United States and do not appear very anxious to come out and try again. Wagging his head in a vigorous, characteristic movement, he solemnly continued, The Japanese know what it means that the United States Marines have landed. The commander-in-chief's next words were followed by loud shouting and roaring applause, and I think I may add, having Iwo Jima in mind, that the situation is well in hand. This, too, was the day the cemeteries were dedicated. Marines had been coming down from the high ground in the north since early morning, not because of the flag-raising ceremonies, but to seek out graves of fallen comrades. The burial grounds by now had the appearance of hallowed dignity, and what was spoken at the ceremonies added to the aura. No words of mine can properly express the homage due these heroes, General Cates said of the 4th Division dead, but I can assure them and their loved ones that we will carry their banner forward. They truly died that we might live, and we will not forget. May their souls rest in peace. Navy Lieutenant Roland B. Gittelson, a Jewish chaplain, delivered the eulogy for the 5th Division. Here lie officers and men, Negroes and whites, rich men and poor together. Here are Protestants, Catholics and Jews together. Here no man prefers another because of his faith or despises him because of his colour. Here there are no quotas of how many from each group are admitted or allowed. Among these men there is no discrimination, no prejudices, no hatred. Theirs is the highest and purest democracy. Rabbi Gittelson spoke of high hopes for a post-war world, of joining hands with Britain, China and Russia in peace, even as we have in war, to build the kind of world you died for. Out of this, and from the suffering and sorrow of those we mourn, will come, we promise, the birth of a new freedom for the sons of men everywhere. General Erskine was visibly moved, his frame ramrod straight as his tearful gaze swept the rows of markers in the 3rd Division resting place. There is nothing I can say which is wholly adequate to this occasion, he began, only the accumulated praise of time will pay proper tribute to our valiant dead. Long after those who lament their immediate loss are themselves dead, these men will be mourned by the nation, for they are the nation's loss. A gust of wind rustled the two pages from which he read. Another flight of Mustangs roared down the runway, some two hundred yards away, and lifted skyward for support missions against the gorge and Cushman's pocket. The dust from their takeoff runs had not settled when a twin-engine Navy hospital plane landed for another load of casualties. Now Erskine began again. There is talk of great history, of the greatest fight in our history, of unheard of sacrifice and unheard of courage, he said. These phrases are correct, but they are prematurely employed. The evidence has not sufficiently been examined. Even the words and phrases used by historians to describe the fight for Iwo Jima when the piecemeal story of our dead comes to light, will still be inadequate. Victory was never in doubt, its cost was. What was in doubt in all our minds was whether there would be any of us left to dedicate our cemetery at the end, or whether the last Marine would die knocking out the last Japanese gun and gunner. Let the world count our crosses. Let them count them over and over. Let us do away with names, with ranks and rates and unit designations here. Do away with the terms, regular, reserve, veteran, boot, old-timer, replacement. They are empty, categorising words which belong only in the adjutant's dull vocabulary. The general paused. Here lie only, another pause, only marines. The dedication of the last cemetery was over. For the rest of the day, men who could be spared from the battle came down from the front for requiems of their own. They came singly, in pairs, in small groups. Most walked, but some hitched rides on jeeps or supply trucks. 
they moved reverently down the rows of markers, some walking less slowly than others. They were searching for a particular name, for a close buddy's grave. Others shuffled along. Virtually all were in grimy and ragged dungarees, steel helmets in hand, rifles slung over shoulders. One man with a black beard and dirt-encrusted eyebrows hesitated before one grave, moved on, looked back for a fleeting second, and moved on again, crying to himself and cursing, this no good island, this no good war. At the edge of the 5th Division Cemetery nearest Suribachi, the engines of two bulldozers roared and treads clanked as they dug fresh trenches for more graves. Marines still to be buried lay nearby in neat rows, their bodies covered with ponchos and blankets. Worn shoes and leggings stuck out here and there from under the make-do shrouds. A jeep ambulance pulled up with three more bodies. The two-man burial detail quickly, gently lifted them to a bank of volcanic ash and drove away, back to the fighting on another unending trip. With most of General Kuribayashi's troops bottled up in three small but savage pockets, the pattern of attack had changed. No longer were attacks preceded by heavy naval and artillery heavy shelling. The danger was too great that shelling would eliminate more marines than Japanese. Thus, the cruisers Salt Lake City and Tuscaloosa, their missions completed, steamed away to rendezvous with the fleet for the invasion of Okinawa. Six destroyers remained on station to light the front at night with parachute flares and star shells. P-51 Mustangs still flew close air support missions when they could unload explosives or napalm on Japanese strongpoints without hitting marines. Flame-throwing tanks, their fire-spitting muzzles spewing as many as 10,000 gallons of flame oil daily, were now the major heavy weapons spearheading the final phase of the campaign. But more than ever, the burden of the battle was on the infantry, riflemen, demolition squads and backpack flamethrowers smashing head-on against Japanese, whose only reason to survive another day was to take the lives of Marines. Attrition was terrible beyond belief Colonel Tom Warnham's 27th Regiment had ceased to exist. The 2nd Battalion, Major Antonelli's old outfit, now was commanded by Major Gerald F. Russell. But so few men were left that the unit was pulled off the front so shredded that it never fought again. The 1st Battalion lost its 3rd commanding officer in nine days when Major William Tumbleston's left arm was severely wounded by machine gun fire. Fewer than 500 men were all that remained of the regiment's D-Day roster of 3,000. Lieutenant Colonel Don Robertson was the only original battalion commander still in action. For the rest of the campaign, he led a special composite battalion, all that was left of the 27th Marines, in the fighting to wipe out the last Japanese in the gorge. Two medals of honour would be awarded for deeds of valour the day Admiral Nimitz proclaimed Iwo Jima United States Territory. One was posthumous. It went to 18-year-old Private George Phillips from Rich Hill, Missouri, a frightened replacement who had been in the lines for two days. But boot camp had imbued him with Marine Corps esprit de corps and a devotion to his comrades. When a hand grenade landed near the mouth of a bypassed cave where he had taken cover with three men, the teenager smothered the blast, sacrificing his life for men he hardly knew. Private Franklin E. Sigler was not a replacement, but Iwo was his first campaign. Every day had been a frightening one for the twenty-year-old from Little Falls, New Jersey. Now, in the bedlam of battle to silence the gorge, he showed his mettle. Taking command of his leaderless squad, his Medal of Honor citation would read, he led a bold charge, then, disregarding his own wounds, he carried three comrades to safety and returned to fight on until ordered to retire for treatment. Marines on the front settled in for a night of relative quiet. They expected few fireworks, possibly some Japanese stragglers looking for food and water, but that was all. Twilight had been magnificent, the brilliance of the setting sun burning through scattered cumulus clouds like dying embers in a fireplace. Three miles to the south, near the official flag, Movies had begun to flicker on the screens of three makeshift outdoor theatres now on the island. Fires burned in steel barrels where men heated coffee or water to wash clothes and shave, some to bathe as best as they could. Others talked over the day's events, some wrote letters home. Radios in communications jeeps were tuned to Tokyo Rows or shortwave broadcasts from Guam and the States, their speakers blaring with the pleasant sounds of dance music. Motoyama No. 1 was heavy with sundown traffic, 
sinister-looking Army P-61, Black Widow night fighters taking off on patrols between Iwo and Japan, the last of the day's flights leaving Iwo with wounded Marines for the Marianas, P-51S setting down from final low-level sweeps over enemy positions near Kitano Point, three superfortresses, hit in an attack on Nagoya but now airworthy, awaited clearance to roar down the north-south runway and fly to Saipan for further repairs, then to stand by for their next mission. Along the western beaches, just north of Suribachi, two men were on security patrol. Marines later said they were army troops, but the evidence is that they were bored leathernecks. Moving in opposite directions, both had walkie-talkie radios. One man began to fantasise, and in his mind, he became an on-the-spot radio reporter covering the biggest story of his life. What would be his words, he asked himself, if his job was to broadcast the first news of an Allied victory in Europe? Before realising what he was doing, he switched on his set and said the fateful words, Flash, an official statement from Radio Berlin announces that Nazi Germany has accepted terms of unconditional surrender. The war in Europe is over. Now the incredible happened. Not only was the transmission heard by the other walkie-talkie, but also in the communications centre at 5th Corps headquarters and in the radio shack of an offshore ship where an operator was monitoring news reports from the mainland. Without a second thought, he blared the announcement over the vessel's loudspeaker system and relayed it to the rest of the fleet. Within minutes, pandemonium erupted across the island. Rifles and machine guns cracked and chattered on the lines in joyful celebration. Star shells and parachute flares from the destroyers illuminated every yard of the front. A destroyer sent a cascade of rockets screaming across Kitano Point with no target in mind, only a thunderous and brilliant display of jubilation. Transports and landing ship, tanks let go with anti-aircraft batteries, firing hundreds of shells, lighting the skies thousands of feet above the fleet and over the island. Movies broke up in Bedlam. Men leaped into the air, cheering and yelling and slapping one another on the back. This was it. Victory in Europe. Now Japan soon would feel the full force of military power that had battered Hitler's Europe into submission. Men crawled from foxholes and tents to join in the raucous festivities, some not knowing what they were celebrating, but certain it was something historic. General Schmidt, fuming at the undisciplined Marine and Navy firing, was on the radio telephone with Admiral Hill on the Auburn to find out what was happening. By then, all hands aboard the flagship knew the report was false. Only after 15 minutes, when a condition red alert was flashed ashore and to the fleet, did the firing cease. Private First Class Alvin J. Doyle, a third division correspondent from Brooklyn who had covered New York City Hall for the Daily Mirror, wrote the next day, It was a great feeling while it lasted, but it was a dirty trick. The brass was too embarrassed to let the people at home know about what Harry Schmidt later called the incident of the false surrender. Aid stations treated a dozen minor casualties, victims of falling shell fragments from the short-lived celebration. The identity of the marine culprit who caused it all remains one of Iwo's lost secrets. General Kuribayashi, in his cave headquarters deep in the gorge, learned that night of Admiral Nimitz's proclamation in a special broadcast from Japan. It glorified the surviving defenders and exhorted them to hold out to the last man as valiant sons of Japan, eliminating repugnant Americans as you die for emperor and homeland. Schoolchildren from the General's birthplace, a small village on the outskirts of Tokyo, closed the programme with prayers for the doomed garrison and by singing the Song of Iwo Jima, specially written for the occasion. The enemy commander must have felt deeply moved at the words. Even hard-bitten Navy interpreters, monitoring the transmission in the Combat Information Centre on the Auburn, were touched by the tiny voices of the boys and girls as they sang, Where dark tides billow in the ocean, a wink-shaped isle of mighty fame guards the gateway to our empire. Iwo Jima is its name. Kuribayashi responded with an eloquent message of thanks to the gallant and brave people of Japan. He vowed to continue the battle, saying, I am pleased to report that we still fight well against the overwhelming material odds of the enemy, and all my officers and men deserve the highest commendation. I humbly apologise to my emperor that I have failed to live up to expectations, and have to yield this key island to the enemy after seeing so many of my officers and men dead. General Rocky, in his revetment command post two miles away, 
pondered the next move to silence the gorge and end the battle in the 5th Division sector. He wondered if his feeble attack battalions still had the manpower to finish the job. Orders went out for 10% of all rear echelon men to be ready on one hour's notice to bulwark the onerous shortage of riflemen on the front. Nearly 200 cannoneers from the 15th Regiment went into the lines the next morning, along with 55 men from the division's Amtrak's battalion and 105 truck drivers from the 5th Motor Transport Battalion. More than 60% were casualties within 48 hours. March 17th, D plus 26, was another red-letter day in the official chronology of the battle. Admiral Nimitz issued a special communique, the last of the campaign, announcing that Iwo had been officially secured at 6pm and that organised Japanese resistance had ended. The announcement lauded all branches of the armed forces for their roles in the terrible fighting, particularly the Marines. He reported that 24,127 had fallen, 4,189 dead in action and 19,938 wounded during 26 days and 9 hours of combat, the costliest battle in 168 years of Marine Corps history. The communique concluded, Among the Americans who served on Iwo Island, uncommon valour was a common virtue. To the Marines at the front, especially those hacking away against stubborn resistance in the devilish sandstone buttes of Cushman's pocket, and those ensnared in the seemingly endless struggle for the gorge, it appeared the Admiral again had been too hasty in writing off Kuribayashi and what remained of his troops, organised or not. When a 3rd Division machine gunner heard about the communique, he shook his head in disbelief. If this damned place has been secured, I wonder where in the hell all the Japanese fire is coming from, he said. It was a common reaction among the troops, many of them bitter over the fact that the home front now most certainly believed the battle was over, even as Marines still were being wounded and dead. The final phase of the campaign would last another ten days and claim another 1,724 American casualties before the island was in fact secured and the fighting finally was over. General Kuribayashi long since had abandoned all hope of driving the invaders from the island or of his own survival but he was still alive and planning one desperate final attack before dying leading his troops in battle or committing harakiri with his ancestral samurai sword. The situation is now on the brink of the last, his farewell message to Imperial General Headquarters in Tokyo said. At midnight I shall lead the final offensive, praying that our empire will eventually emerge victorious and secure. Unless this island is wrested back, our country will not be secure. Even as a ghost, I wish to be a vanguard of future Japanese operations against this place. Bullets are gone and water exhausted. Now that we are ready for the final act, I am grateful to have been given this opportunity to respond to the gracious will of the Emperor. Permit me to say farewell. Premier Kuniaki Koiso and his cabinet of warlords had anticipated the fall of Iwo for some time, but they were shaken nonetheless by the loss of the bastion, knowing that Japan's front door now was open to invasion. That night, the Prime Minister went on Radio Tokyo to tell the Japanese nation the mournful news. He said the defeat was the most unfortunate thing in the whole war situation, but promised the conflict would continue. There will be no unconditional surrender, Koiso said, his voice choking. So long as there is one Japanese living, we must fight to shatter the enemy's ambitions. We must not stop fighting until then. If Kuribayashi heard the broadcast, he did not acknowledge it nor did the Japanese high command again hear directly from the doomed general. Fifth Division men, when they finally snuffed out the last stragglers in the gorge, found what probably was the samurai's last order. It apparently was issued the night of Kuribayashi's farewell message. In strong, classic Japanese characters it read, All surviving officers and men. The battle situation has come to the last moment. I want my surviving officers and men to go out and attack the enemy tonight. Each man, go out simultaneously at midnight and attack the enemy until the last. You have devoted yourselves to the Emperor. Do not think of yourselves. I am always at the head of you all. It is most probable that the order never left the General's headquarters, an ill-ventilated and candle-lighted cave beneath a huge camouflaged concrete blockhouse at the head of the gorge. But Marines two days later discovered evidence that Kuribayashi and what was left of his staff 
moved through tunnels that night with four hundred men to a last stand cave near a Kitano point, where when or how the Japanese commander died was never determined, nor was his body found. Some survivors, taken prisoner by 3rd Division mop-up troops, said he committed harakiri shortly after midnight of March 25th. Other prisoners of war said he passed away next day, a doubtful probability, since the attack was made two miles from the general's last known command post. What is known is that on the night of March 21st, Kuribayashi sent a final message to the garrison on Chichijima. My officers and men are still fighting, it said. The enemy front line is 200 metres from us, and they are attacking with flamethrowers and tanks. They have advised us to surrender by leaflets and loudspeakers, but we only laughed at this childish trick. All officers and men on Chichijima goodbye. It was the last transmission from the Japanese on Iwo Jima, but it was still not the finale of the battle. Howlin' Mad Smith came ashore from the Auburn and left Iwo the day it was declared secure. So did a handful of 4th Division troops, a shallow trickle of thousands who had swarmed the D-Day beaches. Some stopped off at the cemetery to pay final homage to dead comrades before boarding beached landing ship, tanks for the 5,000-mile voyage back to base camp in the Hawaiian Islands. The general left in style. Admiral Nimitz had sent his personal plane, a four-engine Douglas transport, to fly the old warrior back to Pearl Harbor. It was the least the commander-in-chief Pacific could do for the man who had led his marines in an unbroken chain of victories across the central Pacific to the doorstep of Japan's home islands. A press conference was held at Makalapa. We showed the Japanese at Iwo Jima that we can take any damn thing they have got, Smith told Rear Echelon Newsman. Watching the marines cross the island reminded me of Pickett's charge at Gettysburg. Mortar, artillery fire and rockets fell among the troops, but they closed. In 37 minutes after the first wave hit the beach, we were on the southern end of the airfield. I say again, this was the toughest fight we have had so far. If there had been any question whether there should be a Marine Corps after this war, the Battle of Iwo Jima will assure that there will always be a Marine Corps. B-29s filled the skies over Iwo that night. 307 superfortresses in a 60-mile-long armada heading for a massive firebomb attack on Kobe. They left Japan's sixth largest city an inferno. Nearly 3,000 dead, 12,000 plus wounded, 240,000 homeless, and 66,000 buildings destroyed. And Iwo Jima, because it was there and in American hands, saved the lives of another 150 flyers. Thirteen bombers, crippled by anti-aircraft fire over the target, landed on the island. On Saipan, General LeMay briefed newsmen. Iwo Jima is really making the job easier, he said. The 20th Air Force's top commander spoke with first-hand knowledge. He had piloted the Pathfinder bomber on the mission. Back in Washington, Secretary of War Henry L. Stimson wrote Navy Secretary Forrestal to congratulate the Marines on the capture of the island. The price has been heavy, the Army's representative in President Roosevelt's cabinet said, but the military value of Iwo Jima is inestimable. Its conquest has brought closer the day of our final victory in the Pacific. Fighting in Cushman's pocket was coming to its violent end. On D plus 25, the last hard core of resistance had been squeezed into a deep gorge roughly 200 yards long, but the enemy continued to determinedly hold out. Fierce, small arms and machine gun fire came from caves, spider traps and dug-in tanks. Artillery could no longer be used for fear of landing on the marines. Tanks were unable to manoeuvre in the narrow ravines. So 5th Corps engineers built four specially designed sleds, each mounting 20 rocket-launching tubes that could deliver 640 pounds of TNT in a single salvo. They were winched forward in an attempt to put an end to the fighting. Ten barrages smashed the pocket area, an official report on the day's action said, and although the effect could not be directly observed, no miracle had taken place. Enemy resistance continued undiminished as the Marines moved in. By mid-afternoon, tank bulldozers had carved paths for flame throwing Shermans to sear every target they could find. At sundown, there was no answering fire as Marines advanced to the end of the ravine. It had taken six days to accomplish what a battalion of crack troops might have done in a day, two at the most. But the task had fallen to a handful of surviving old-timers and inexperienced replacements to finally overrun Cushman's pocket. 
When it fell, there was nothing left of Kuribayashi's defences in the third division zone. About the same time Cushman's pocket was silenced, a series of blasts shook the island. They came from the gorge, where 5th Division engineers detonated 8,500 pounds of TNT in a chain of five thundering explosions that ended organised resistance around Kitano Point. The 4th Division, too, swept through the last enemy strongpoints in its sector. From now on, it was a matter of mopping up, of another ten days of costly work for patrols of riflemen, flamethrowers and demolitions teams wiping out bypassed bunkers, caves, pillboxes and stragglers, hiding wherever they could find concealment. Private First Class, Walter Josephiak, 19, of Detroit, Michigan, was at the point of one six-man Third Division mop-up patrol with Rusty, his war dog. The detail had cleaned out two pockets of stragglers, killing seven, and were moving warily toward the mouth of another cave. Josephiak and Rusty were some fifteen yards ahead when a low growl came from the Doberman Pinscher. His alerted handler spotted a sniper about to fire from behind a large rock guarding the entrance. He eliminated him with a carbine burst. With a savage snarl and a loud bark, the dog signalled the presence of another Japanese, who fell in an immediate fusillade. Another sniper popped up. Josephiak fired again, wounding him. But as the enemy fell forward, he let loose with two rounds that thudded into the PFC's shoulder and chest. By now the air was full of hand grenades hurled by other Japanese. Rusty darted to his wounded master and was lying at his side, between him and the cave mouth, when a grenade exploded nearby and its fragments tore into Josephiak. He shouted for someone to call the dog to safety and motioned back two corpsmen who had started forward to give him first aid. Another grenade roared. Rusty took the full blast in a vain attempt to shield Josephiak. He died without a whimper. Josephiak managed to roll to the cover of several boulders. Marines on a ridge above the cave threw a rope. Grasping it, he was pulled from the ledge. A jeep ambulance carried him and Rusty's body to the 3rd Division Hospital. Josephiak died that night and was buried the next day. Not far away, in a tiny and special section of the 3rd Division Cemetery, a small marker carried the stenciled words, Corporal Rusty, 3D War Dog Platoon. More Marines came down every day from the battlefield, grime-encrusted men in ragged dungarees, mostly unsmiling men with blank stares that mirrored the raw fighting, men inwardly proud of what they had accomplished but bitter over the awful losses, men with a smouldering hatred for the Japanese, but with a measure of grudging respect for the self-annihilating determination of the foe. Shadow platoons, shot-to-pieces companies, battalions with a handful of survivors, regiments that could not muster a thousand men, made their way to the black sand of the beachhead. The stark, appalling, brutal, tragic fact was that of all the marines who landed on Iwo, nearly 30% were casualties. But the average losses of attack units, the troops who fought on the front, were 60%. Some outfits covered the three miles on foot, men too weary and disheartened to move at more than a slow and laborious shuffle. Jeeps and trucks carried others to the re-embarkation points. For many, there was a grim, final farewell stop at the cemeteries to bid fallen comrades a last goodbye. On March 19th, one month after D-Day, and at almost the same hour the first troops hit the beaches, the last 4th Division survivors boarded transports and landing ship, tanks to begin the long journey back to Maui, back to the base camp on the volcano, there to fill depleted ranks with new men, and shortly to begin training for the invasion of Japan. The 5th Division was gone by March 27th, sailing in convoy for Hawaii, the Big Island, and for the inevitable preparation for what was expected to be the final climactic campaign of the war. It would be April 12th before the last 3rd Division troops departed for Guam to refit and gird to spearhead the planned million-man invasion force against the enemy homeland. On D plus 35, General Schmidt closed the 5th Corps command post and flew to Pearl Harbor. CB battalions would remain on Iwo Jima to help complete its build-up into a forward base with striking power unimagined by the Marines who conquered shrewd General Kuribayashi's island fortress. General Chansey, S. 147th Army Regiment, recently arrived from New Caledonia in the South Pacific, would finish the mop-up and take over occupation duties. In the dark pre-dawn stillness of March 26th, exactly five weeks after D-Day, 
between two and three hundred Japanese launched a final self-destructive attack, not a drunken shouting charge, but a well-organized and silent raid that bore every sign of Kuribayashi's cunning and determination. The first indication of trouble came at 5.15 a.m., when a sudden sharp outburst of small arms fire broke out in a bivouac area just west of Motoyama No. 2. Peacefully at sleep in a complex of tents were nearly 300 men, a mixed bag of marine shore parties and supply troops, Air Corps crewmen, Army anti-aircraft gunners and Seabees. All had bedded down believing there was no danger within miles. After all, organised resistance had ceased. The island was officially secured. Things might have been different if the Americans were all combat troops, but most were unaccustomed to the bitter business of man-to-man -man fighting and the enemy commander, whoever he was, had picked shrewdly the spot where the Japanese could expect to inflict maximum destruction before their certain annihilation. Moving grimly and silently, the enemy struck from three directions. Within seconds, Japanese were everywhere, slashing tent walls, knifing sleeping men who never knew what hit them, throwing hand grenades, swinging ceremonial swords, firing automatic weapons. By a stroke of fortune, the brunt of the attack hit the 5th Pioneer Battalion. The unit had finished its shore party work and was ready to leave the island that day. Like all Marines, they were combat troops first, specialists second, and they knew what to do in such circumstances. First, Lieutenant Harry L. Martin of Busiris, Ohio, threw up a scrimmage line manned largely by black troops, who coolly beat back one attack, then another, by screaming Japanese firing wildly as they came. It was now light enough to see what was happening, and Martin moved forward to help other Marines in a foxhole and was wounded twice. Then the 34-year-old reserve officer overran a machine gun position, eliminating four Japanese with his pistol. Fifth Division infantrymen, standing by to head for the beach and board ship, heard the fury and joined the melee. The attack was beaten back in furious fighting. Wounded and dead, friend and foe littered the scene. A company of men from the Army's 147th Infantry Regiment appeared with a flamethrower tank shortly after 8 a.m., nearly three hours after the first shots were fired. By then, Iwo's last battle was over. In the tents were 44 dead airmen and 88 wounded. Nine Marines were dead and 31 wounded, the last of 25,851 to fall in 36 days. Strewn about the battleground were 262 Japanese bodies. 18 were taken prisoner, the last of fewer than 200 captured by Marines. No one knows the name of the first Marine who sacrificed his life on the awful island. But the name of the last was First Lieutenant Harry L. Martin. He gave his life fighting for his comrades, his corps, his country, and he had earned the last medal of honour to go to the valiant men of Iwo Jima. Was General Kuribayashi mortally wounded leading the final pre-dawn self-annihilating attack of March 26th? Or did he die the ceremonial death of a samurai warrior by committing seppuku in his cave redoubt deep in the cliffs around Kitano Point? What happened to the other ranking Japanese officers of the Iwo Jima garrison? The questions will remain forever unanswered. Speculation about the final hours and ultimate fate of the general and his commanders is based almost entirely on hearsay rumours, with only vague and piecemeal documentation and a handful of eyewitness survivors to support them. All battle records on Iwo were burned, along with regimental battle flags, by Kuribayashi's aides before they died. He was determined the Americans would have no memorabilia by which to remember their victory and his disgrace. And most documents that existed at Imperial General Headquarters were lost in the fire bombings of Tokyo or in the shambles of Japan's final days before the downfall and surrender. Major Mitsuaki Hara, whose battalion was wiped out on D-Day atop the terraces inland from Yellow Beach 2, was the highest-ranking Japanese to survive. Captured by 3rd Division troops on March 25th in a cliffside cave at the northern end of the island, he knew nothing of what happened to any of the last-ditch defenders. During all the fighting, Marines took just 216 prisoners, many of them non-combatant Koreans from a labour battalion. During April and May, General Cheney's 147th Army Regiment captured another 867 prisoners of war and eliminated 1,602 Japanese in the final mop-up. But a year later, emaciated foragers, unaware the war was over, 
still were being captured or slain in ambush as they crept at night from caves in search of food and water, and to eliminate Americans if they could. One far-fetched account of Kuribayashi's last hours puts him at the point that ripped through the tents of the sleeping Americans, being hit by machine gun fire after Lieutenant Martin organised the Marine scrimmage line, and then being dragged by three of his own men to a cave where the general passed away. Another version is more in keeping with Kuribayashi's known character and ancestral background. It was pieced together by Marine intelligence officers after interrogating two badly wounded and frightened enlisted men captured in the gorge after it was overrun. General Kuribayashi died shortly after dawn on Sunday, March 18th, after issuing his last order to the remaining trickle of troops to go out simultaneously at midnight and attack the enemy until the last. At the mouth of what American and Japanese military personnel stationed on Iwo in 1984 still called the General's Cave, Kuribayashi knelt and bowed three times, facing north toward the Imperial Palace, 650 miles across the sea. Begging forgiveness from Emperor Hirohito in a final prayer, the General plunged a harakiri knife into his abdomen. At that moment, a trusted aide, standing over him with a sword, brought it down across his neck. The traditional coup de grace severed Kuribayashi.